Well, good afternoon. We have hit our noontime moment here in uh, February. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to um, our Heart and Vascular Lecture Series. Um, happy Heart Month, as we say here for February each year. Um, we wanted to, again, welcome you to our Heart and Vascular Lecture Series. My name is Heidi Zalai. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist um, in cardiac rehab at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, we're happy to continue our tradition here with the February Heart Series for you uh, virtually now for our second year, although we've been doing this for over 20 years, which is absolutely amazing, um, including both our, our virtual and in-person sessions. Uh, please know that each of our presentations each week is going to be recorded and available to you again for viewing, if you'd like, on the baystatehealth.org website. Uh, there's a little icon that um, is green, a little green icon that says watch virtual events. And if you click on there, you should be able to see uh, this event and others uh, that we hope is uh, something that maybe you would want to share or something um, for those that were not able to attend live today. They can revisit it. Um, you can also register in that same area uh, for upcoming lectures that we have for the heart and vascular lecture series, but also for other uh, series and, and lectures that Bay State hosts, which is fantastic. Um, today, I'd like to thank Jeff and Sue for audio and, and video, visual and all of the marketing that they've done behind the scenes as well to help make this um, uh, presentation series continue. Uh, we know it's not going to be possible without your, without your support. So thanks again so much. Um, as in years past, we certainly would welcome your questions um, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, you can type your questions in the Q&A, which for me, it's on the right-hand side of my screen. It may be a little different for you, um, but you can type your questions in there. And again, we'll address um, as many as possible uh, at the end of the lecture today. We just ask that you keep your questions pertinent to the information that we're addressing here today. Uh, and then finally, we'd like to um, have you provide an opportunity. We'd like to provide an opportunity for you to uh, give your feedback, which should pop up automatically on the screen if uh, it's the same as last year. So you will be prompted to just give your feedback, and we appreciate any comments that you have. It really helps to make our uh, lecture series even better for the following year. Uh, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters today uh, for our discussion about the heart and soul of heart disease. Uh, Dr. Adam Stern is going to be talking with us first. He's a preventive cardiologist at Bay State Franklin Medical Center in Greenfield in Northampton. He completed his fellowship at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Memorial Hospital, his residency at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, internship at Cedar sinai Medical Center, uh, and he earned his medical degree at the Case Western Reserve University of Medicine. Dr. Stern will be reviewing uh, with us the factors that put us at risk for developing heart disease. And then we're also going to be hearing from Rabbi Kenneth Hahn, who is an interfaith chaplain at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield. He earned his MBA from Yale and BA in sociology from Harvard. He was later ordained a rabbi by the Jewish Spiritual Leadership Institute. At Bay State, Dr. Uh, Rabbi Hahn works primarily in the cardiac line with patients and families in the heart and vascular critical care unit and with patients who have recently suffered a heart attack or undergone cardiac surgery. Like all chaplains at Bay State, Rabbi Hahn supports patients from all faith traditions, as well as those who identify spiritual as spiritual but not religious and those who don't expose to any faith whatsoever. Rabbi Hahn also works as a coach helping corporate executives become better leaders through mindfulness-based behaviors, modification practices. Today, he'll be talking about mindfulness as we focus on managing stress, anxiety, and depression, which are also considers, considered risk factors for heart disease. Uh, these are extremely pertinent topics many of us have, face, uh, have been faced with, especially over the past several years. So Dr. Stern, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we look forward to hearing from you both. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for the nice introduction, Heidi. Um, I, I really look forward to speaking with you and, and look forward to answering any questions you might have at the end of our talks. I think um, we're probably all interested um, in understanding a little bit more about you know, better health. And in particular, I'm going to be speaking with you about 
what we can do to promote cardiovascular health. And, you know, probably some of you are here because you have a personal history of heart disease. Uh, maybe it's a close family friend or a family member um, who's had an event, or maybe you don't have heart disease yourself, but you're just curious. Um, these are really important topics to discuss um, just because of the, the huge burden of heart disease uh, in the United States. It's, it's actually uh, the number one uh, source of morbidity and mortality in the United States. Um, about 660,000 patients die from heart disease each year. Over 1 million are hospitalized with either a heart attack, a need for a stent, uh, bypass surgery, or a valve surgery. And then another um, over 1 million are hospitalized with heart failure each year. A large burden of, of heart disease is due to something called atherosclerosis, which is a hardening of the arteries due to plaque or fat deposition within the, the arteries, and in particular in the, the heart arteries. It makes the blood vessels less distendable, um, less flexible, and um, can literally limit the degree to which the body is able to deliver important nutrients to the heart muscle, including oxygen. Um, it starts at a young age for us all and progresses over a lifetime and can lead to chest pain and heart attacks. Um, the reason I, I think it's important to, to screen for uh, heart disease um, is, is that roughly 60% of all adults will be affected by heart disease at some point in their lifetime, whether that's a heart attack, a stroke, or heart failure. And we really have effective means to lower risk in people. So um, it's really not an academic exercise. I think we have important treatments uh, for people uh, to help them uh, prevent an event. Screening can really start at a young age, even as young as age 20. Um, and then later on, once we hit age 40, uh, to estimate a 10 year risk. And that really ought to be done once we hit age 40, about every five years. The, the common culprits for, for cardiovascular disease are things you probably would all imagine, um, things like uh, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, family history of early onset heart disease, and high cholesterol levels. The way I screen people um, is I take into all of those factors and I, I incorporate them into something called a pooled cohort equation. And this is something I frequently do in the office with my patients. Um, and that's essentially enabling me to come up with an estimate for that patient and myself about, you know, what is roughly their 10 year or their decade, um, the ensuing decade risk for them. You know, what is the, the percent chance that they might have an event? If I were to say, look at 100 people similar to that patient, um, how many of those 100 people might have a problem? Um, and this, these kinds of pooled cohort equations are actually available online to anybody. Um, and they're fairly simple. They, they take into account someone's sex, age, race, level of cholesterol, blood pressure, whether someone's on a treatment medication for blood pressure or diabetes. And, and essentially it's able to fairly, in a fairly sophisticated way, come up with an estimated risk for that patient. And some of that data is based out of these longitudinal studies that um, have been developed over the last decades, one of which was the Framingham Heart Study, which followed patients for years and years um, and ended up determining which factors are important. And it's, it's essentially what I've just said, which is smoking history, blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, et cetera. So here's an example of a, of a woman um, who is 59. Um, she's a diabetic. She has high blood pressure. She's on a medication for high blood pressure. And her, and her lipids are a little high, nothing alarmingly high, but still elevated beyond what they should be. And you really get a sense pretty quickly with her on the towards the top left of the screen what her 10-year risk would be. In other words, if I were to follow a hundred people like her over the next 10 years, about one in four 
or 26% would have a heart attack or stroke. Um, and over her lifetime, uh, she has about a one in a two chance of having an event. So I think that kind of data is really powerful, um, not only for me, but for the patients that I'm seeing in the office. I think, I think if we all saw numbers like that for ourselves, I think we'd be pretty motivated to, to try to do whatever we can to prevent an event. Um, I break up the, the thresholds kind of into three categories. There's high risk patients who have a 10 year event rate of greater than a seven and a half percent, in which case I think we, gotta be, we have to be all in, do everything we can to try to lower that patient's risk, whether that's lowering their blood pressure, losing weight, getting them on a cholesterol lowering medication. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's people who are low risk, less than 5% chance of having an event, in which case we're really just trying to keep up with their habits, uh, maintain their body weight, keep the cholesterol levels the way they are. And then there's people in the middle between five and seven and a half percent risk who, you know, the decision's a little more nuanced about what to do. Um, do we want to maybe just focus on one thing, losing weight, maybe altering their diet? Um, do we also maybe want to get them on a statin too? And, and those are the kinds of discussions I have with patients in the office. So risk factors overall, which, which I've alluded to, are blood pressure, high blood pressure, smoking, having a healthy diet, controlling our glucose levels, having a good body weight, controlling our lipid numbers or our cholesterol numbers, and staying active. Um, these are encompassed um, by what the American Heart Association calls the Life Simple 7. Um, I'm going to start with high blood pressure. Um, this is really the, the silent killer, unfortunately, for a lot of people. Um, and, and our cardiovascular risk really starts to rise dramatically at 140 over 90. Um, it's the most important risk factor for having a stroke, unfortunately. Um, and it's also an important component in heart failure. Smoking, um, I, I think, as we all know, is a huge culprit um, for, for lung disease, but also cardiovascular disease as well. And really, the goal uh, with smoking should be to not smoke at all and to have complete cessation and no exposure to environmental tobacco smoke. Smoking is harmful uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, first and foremost, it increases blood pressure and heart rate. Um, it promotes blood clotting, uh, the sort of inappropriate blood clotting that can occur in a heart attack. Um, it contains cancer-causing agents or, car or carcinogens, which can affect the lungs, and it also damages artery walls. There was a time, unfortunately, where uh, we didn't necessarily know the truth about tobacco and all of, all of the harm it was causing. And, and, and at one point in time, believe it or not, doctors were actually used to endorse uh, certain brands of cigarettes. Uh, times have really changed, fortunately. Um, unfortunately, with smoking, um, even though we know it's really important, and I think patients know it's important to quit, um, the efficacy of quitting on your own can be quite low. Um, some studies have quoted as low as uh, 5%. Um, so really, I think it's, it's important for family members, friends, and, and the physician to, to help that motivated patient quit as much as possible. And I think it, it, that can be done with a combination of counseling, you know, getting that patient to a group therapy session in the community through 1-800-QUIT-NOW to help them get the kind of support they need to help quit get them through those periods of high cravings, um, to actively replace nicotine, which we know is the most addictive part of smoking um, through patches or gum or lozenges, and then to even use um, other medications like Chantix and Wellbutrin to help with cravings. Diet. Um, is probably one of the things we can control the most in terms of preventing um, a cardiovascular event and promoting heart health. And, and you really can't talk diet without using the C word or the cholesterol word. Um, cholesterol is an important fat in our body. Um, it circulates in the blood and it's really important for building certain 
uh, molecules in our body. It's, it's involved um, in the production of certain hormones. Um, it's used to help build our cell walls. Um, and it's important for neurologic function. Unfortunately, too much of it can lead to problems. Um, and it can essentially um, line the arteries of our heart, leading to atherosclerosis and um, artery blockages. Um, it's carried in the bloodstream by things called uh, lipoproteins, um, which transport it. Um, and there's two kinds of lipoproteins I'm going to talk about today. There's the bad lipoprotein called low-density lipoprotein, or LDL. And then there's the good lipoprotein called high-density lipoprotein, or HDL. And that's the lipoprotein, the HDL, which actually helps scavenge the bad and can prevent, to a certain extent, the buildup of cholesterol in our heart arteries. Well, you know, there's really no debate about the fact that the higher our total serum cholesterol is, the higher our risk of having a heart-related event. This has been shown time and time again. And I thought along those lines, um, I'd engage the audience a little bit and, you know, feel free to, to chime in if you want. I know there's a fair amount of you out there. Um, um, what, what does the audience think? Do, do, do you think that, that low-fat diets are better than high-fat diets for your heart? True or false? Just because there's so many of you out there, I mean, it's probably not possible to um, participate as well through WebEx. Um, you know, just give that a thought for a few moments, um, and I'll give you my thoughts. And, and what I'll say is that that's, that's false. Um, I think the real answer is probably a little more nuanced, and, and it really depends on what kind of fat. Um, certainly, if, if you're going to have a high uh, saturated fat diet, that's absolutely bad for your heart and your cardiovascular system. Um, but if you can have good fats in your diet, um, like poly and monounsaturated fats, um, that's going to be a, a huge benefit to you. Um, there's really no controversy. Um, about the fact that if we have a high saturated fat diet in our diet, our LDL cholesterol goes up. That is our bad cholesterol go, goes up. And that that is in turn related to a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And um, this slide just demonstrates the variety of trials over time that have shown that. Um, and, and as with most cardiology trials, they, they have um, a lot of acronyms, um, and that, that's what the names of these trials are. I think we all know to an extent kind of what, what sorts of foods lead to high saturated fat diet. I mean, I think a lot of this trickles down into the news and, and popular culture. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you all know about wanting to avoid red meat, um, that that leads to, to high saturated fat in the diet and elevated total cholesterol numbers. Um, trans fat, like fried foods, are obviously bad. Um, one thing that I think uh, probably is a little underestimated by people is, is cheese and high-fat dairy. So, you know, while it's okay to have a little bit of that in the diet, you do want to monitor um, so that you're not having too much. Um, and then I think the worst of all things, um, and I, I, I hate to say it, um, is is foods like donuts that are high in hydrogenated oils and trans fats. These are foods that really ought to just be absolutely avoided. The good thing though, with, with having a diet that focuses on the good kinds of fats, um, poly and monounsaturated fats, which are present in foods that I'm showing on this slide, like salmon, avocado, olive oil, and nuts, are that they really can fill you up. Um, they're tasty, um, they fill you up, and they can prevent you from overeating the kinds of other foods that we view as healthy, but I think if overdone or overconsumed can lead to problems. And I'm thinking about carbohydrates. What do people think about um, whether cholesterol deposits can be reversed by diet? People think that can happen or not? 
The answer is that it, that it can. So I'm gonna show you some examples uh, from autopsy from monkeys um, as a kind of a comparison point for humans. Um, on, on the top row is a picture of coronary arteries from monkeys that were fed a very high saturated fat diet and then were subsequently sacrificed. You can see how much atherosclerosis or fat lining the arteries there is um, and how narrow the actual lumen or the, the artery opening is to the point where you can imagine that monkey is getting very little blood flow to its heart. And then below that, um, on the bottom row, are coronary arteries cut in cross-section from a group of monkeys that were fed the same high saturated fat, saturated fat diet, but then they were transitioned to a low saturated fat diet with a low amount of sugar. And you can see just how much regression of atherosclerosis or of black buildup there are in those arteries. Those vessels are wide open, and you can imagine all of the, the good blood flow that that monkey was getting to its heart. The inference here is that they had clogged arteries like in the top row, but then they regressed and um, had fairly clean arteries. So just to summarize, you know, for nutrition, because this is something we can all control. I mean, it's a diet um, and, and some people refer to this as a Mediterranean diet. Um, and that's a diet that emphasizes vegetables, fruits, whole grains, low-fat dairy, fish, lean poultry, vegetables, certain olive, certain oils like olive oil and nuts, and trying to limit the amount of high sugar added foods and red meat. Um, and really the goal um, for saturated fat intake is to be about at five to six percent of all your, all of your calories. So you know for a guy of my size, that's about 18 grams of saturated fat a day, which is certainly achievable if you're if you're avoiding the big culprits. Glucose control is the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, I alluded to the fact that we've, we've unfortunately become a heavier and heavier nation and our rates of obesity have increased dramatically over the last 30 to 40 years. In fact, you can look at a map of obesity trends in our country and superimpose a map detailing the incidence of diabetes and they're essentially equivalent. Um, U.S. sugar consumption um, over the last 200 years has dr risen dramatically on a per capita basis. And so it's not surprising to um, see that the rates of diabetes have really increased over that same time period, um, as you can see in this graph here. Um, we all think, I think we all know that, you know, the various harmful effects of diabetes and first and foremost, um, especially in the era but before, you know, insulin was, was used broadly, you know, it caused blindness. It can, still in spite of insulin use lead to kidney failure and the need for dialysis um, and peripheral neuropathies but um, perhaps something that's maybe not as well appreciated by the general community is that it can lead to heart disease and heart related problems through a combination of you know high blood sugar irritating blood vessels um, and leading to inflammation Um, what does that mean for, for recommendations for a diabetic? Basically, what that means is, is you want to get your long-term sugar level, otherwise known as hemoglobin A1C, to less than 7%. Body weight um, is another huge area where we have some control. And I think if you follow um, good dietary guidelines and stay active, I think that's very um, achievable for a lot of people. Um, obesity is a major contributor to high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, um, decreased physical activity, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, I think even when we you know, gain 5% of our body weight, as little as 10 to 20 pounds, this can have enormous effects on our metabolism, our mood, our energy levels. Um, so I think it's important to remember to try to stay fit and, and, and at an ideal body weight. For, for men, that generally means having a waist circumference less than 40 inches, uh, and for women, less than 35 inches. And um, for both sexes, having a, a body mass index or BMI between 18 and a half and 25 kilograms per meter squared. 
Controlling cholesterol uh, level is, is fortunately something that is, is no longer just dependent on our diet. Um, we have great medications um, available to us to help people control their cholesterol levels. Someone who has maybe tried with diet and still has elevated cholesterol numbers. Um, it, statins really are, 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 the, are the mainstay of lipid lowering therapy and, and have really been studied probably as much as any other drug we have available to us, including aspirin. Um, it's, it's unfortunately a somewhat misunderstood drug. Um, there's a lot of concerns um, that, that I appreciate in the community about it affecting cognitive function, um, which has never really been shown to be the case. There are some people, about 5% of, of people can get muscle aches on it or have liver enzyme abnormalities, but those are generally reversible side effects and there's a huge benefit to taking uh, statins. Um, again, this is the pooled cohort equation for our 59 year old woman that I was talking about before. You know, in her, you know, you can see in the top, her 10 year risk is about 26%. And, you know, you might think, oh, her cholesterol is not so bad. You know, she's only 220. You know, why would you recommend a statin for her? Well, her risk is extraordinarily high. Um, it's greater than seven and a half percent, which is our threshold to begin statin therapy. And, and, and I think some of that, or all of it is really driven by the fact that she's diabetic and she also has high blood pressure in spite of being on high blood pressure meds. So she's someone that would clearly benefit from statin therapy. And then I, I just wanted to bring up some points about HDL. Do, do, does the audience think that raising HDL actively, and I mean by a medication, prevent heart attacks? What, what do people think? Is that true or false? And, you know, the answer is um, false, um, or at least so far not true. Um, observational data has shown that people with high HDLs have a lower risk of heart disease. That's actually different from showing that if you raise HDL actively in somebody, you lower the risk of heart disease. It's sort of confusing. You would think that if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Um, but it's not that straightforward. Um, this data comes out of the AIM HIGH trial, which um, was looking to see if there is benefit of adding something called niacin or niaspan to statin therapy in patients with coronary artery disease high triglycerides and low HDL, and whether that would decrease cardiovascular events. And, and the fact of the matter was, it just wasn't able to prove that. In fact, the trial was stopped early because of no clear benefit. Um, the last of the American Heart Association Life Simple 7 um, interventions, interventions is, is to be active and to stay active. Do people think that by being active or by exercising, cholesterol deposits um, can, be, can be reversed. Um, and the answer is true. Um, it's absolutely true. Um, again, I'm gonna show you some cross-sectional um, pathology slides from, from monkey arteries. Um, the, top, uh, the top short axis image is from a, a coronary artery. Um, in a monkey uh, who was very sedentary. Um, and then the bottom one is from, a, from an exercising monkey. And you can just see the huge difference just, just by looking at it with, with our bare eyes. Um, the difference in, in terms of plaque buildup, the bottom artery is essentially wide open um, and able to fully deliver blood flow and nutrients to the heart muscle. The top one, much more narrowed down. The problem is that, you know, as a country and as, as probably as a world, we've become much less active over the last um, half century. We walk and exercise about a mile and a half fewer than we did compared to 1960. Um, I think the, the nice thing, though, is that most of the benefit um, probably just gets goes it comes from being uh, mildly active compared to being a couch potato. You can see basically on the far left the bar, um, the risk bar for someone who's essentially inactive is a couch potato. Um, and then you can see how that risk drops almost in half by just going to a light exercise routine. And then there's progressive benefit to being more and more active to the point where perhaps you can actually start to cause harm 
if you overexercise, you can develop higher risk of having things like atrial fibrillation. But clearly, in the mild to moderate um, activity level, we, there's huge benefit. Um, exercise uh, not only has a huge uh, benefit in terms of preventing cardiovascular um, uh, bad outcomes, but, but has improved uh, benefits on our mental health, uh, better energy level, improved uh, muscle mass, and better bone health as well. So the solution is to keep walking, stay active, and do whatever we can to stay active, whether that's getting a dog, um, entering a race, biking to work, getting a trainer, getting a pedometer to actually monitor our step count, um, or uh, playing uh, tricks with ourselves, like parking the rear of the parking lot, forcing us to, to getting in a few extra steps, or taking the stairs. So in summary, um, the Life Simple 7 from the American Heart Association, I think, says it all. And if we can remember these things, um, I think we'll all do better. Um, staying active, eating better, losing weight, uh, avoiding tobacco, uh, controlling our cholesterol, managing our blood pressure, um, and reducing blood sugar levels. Knowledge is power. So make a plan, set goals, see a physician, ask for help, engage your community, and take time for yourself. And with that, I wanted to give everybody a huge thank you. And I'm going to pass it on to Rabbi Han. Thank you so much, Dr. Stern. Fantastic presentation. I know it was a quick overview for a lot of you. Um, each one of those topics, actually, we could spend hours and hours on. So uh, we thank you for just kind of doing a, a quick review of the factors that do lead to heart disease. Um, Dr. Han, uh, sorry, Rabbi Han is going to be talking next about um, very specifically stress, which for, uh, again, many of us, it's really been heightened over the past few years with COVID and whatnot. Um, so we wanted to, to take this risk factor and, and really give us some treatment and some ways to, to deal with it, because we know it's not always traditional medicine, and it's not always something that's thought of um, or really treated um, in a physician office. So, uh, Rabbi Han, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Stern for uh, giving us so much information, which hopefully is very helpful to you. I know hearing some of those things myself, even uh, as I measure myself against uh, the optimal standards, occasionally I found myself coming up lacking. And so it's very possible that some of the things you heard today actually caused a little bit of stress. Um, and so what I wanted to do as we uh, transfer from th that time, that uh, information to um, information that relates more to spiritual experience and mindfulness as a way to de-stress oneself, I actually wanted to give you a moment to de-stress. So I, I have here a Tibetan singing bowl and I have earbuds in, but I'm gonna hold it right up close because I, I'm gonna play the chime. This is one of my favorite Tibetan singing bowls. I actually took about two hours to pick this out in a small shop in Kathmandu, Nepal about 35 years ago. And as you hear the chime, maybe you can take a few deep breaths and center yourself as we start to talk about the role of spirituality in healing and mindfulness in de-stressing the heart. Here we go. So um, I wanted to talk about these two things a little bit. And at first they seem quite disparate. Um, and uh, each one of course could be um, a week of investigation or really a lifetime. And yet we're going to try to do it in about the next 20 minutes. And, but I did realize there is a way that these two things are profoundly linked. So I want to talk for a moment or two about um, the role of spirituality and healing. And, and I, I, and I want to talk about uh, what I want, what I'll call the, uh, the pastoral, uh, philosophy of connection, okay, or the theology of connection. And uh, I want to start with a quick story that just happened yesterday. 
I was sitting in my house, very taking a few quiet moments, and I saw, um, and I apologize to those of you who aren't comfortable with spiders. I'm not going to put a picture of a spider up on on the screen, believe me. Um, but I, I saw a very small, tiny, wispy little spider uh, crawling down the wall where near where I was sitting. And it got to a point where there was a big gap because this wall had an overhang between the wall and the floor. And without stopping really, it started to spin a strand of web and just dropped about probably about two, two and a half feet. Just kept going down and down and down and down. And then it got to the floor, clearly in whatever way it does, clipped its web strand and started walking away. And I thought to myself, this is really metaphorical for what we're talking about, because um, I find in spiritual experience, what's really in some respects most important is connection. And it can be all different kinds of connection. For some of us, um, connection to God is paramount. But there are lots of other kinds of connection that are sustaining and um, in my experience, I've found offer patients in the hospital and others incredible comfort and a sense of peace. Connection to community is another type of connection that some of us have. And of course, these are not mutually exclusive. Excuse me, Rabbi Han. I think we need you to have your sh uh, screen shared. So I know you're talking oh. about some points that we had seen. Uh, so I'll, I'll thank my wife for helping me just that. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I'm talking about connection to God, connection to community, connection to family, connection to self. And all of those are sources of support that give us a sense of comfort. And when, um, when people I speak with in the hospital um, locate themselves in connection to one or more of those places that tends to offer them meaning and it gives them a sense of comfort through a very difficult time. So I think back to that spider and uh, that spider just jumping into the abyss in the abyss that many of us face when we are um, given a diagnosis that was unexpected, or we end up um, in the hospital after some cardiac event, we feel very alone frequently. And um, having that sense of connection to something, some group, someone, or to yourself is really, in many respects, what allows people to get through. So. Um, we're, as was mentioned, I'm an interfaith chaplain at Bay State. All of us are um, ordained in one faith tradition or another, but all of us work with everyone, um, including people who don't uh, 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 locate with an organized religion, but do think of themselves as spiritual, and people who have no particular spiritual experience, but still have emotional needs. So we offer spiritual and emotional support to any patient who's interested. And of course, prayer is part of what we do, but there's so much more. So chaplains can uh, do Reiki with patients. We can offer an, an empathetic ear. We can offer attentive presence. We can talk with patients about what gives them hope. So, so whatever, whatever they need, far from religion, if that's what they need, we're there to offer. Now, I was thinking about how a theology of connection would relate to mindfulness. And in, in my way of understanding mindfulness, Mindfulness is a way to connect to self and a, a, an essential part of oneself. 
And so let's talk for a moment about what mindfulness is defined as. Mindfulness, here's it, it's a real buzzword these days, and there are many, many definitions out there you might find. But I really like this one. Mindfulness defined as the capacity to pay full attention to what is going on in ourselves and in the world around us without any judgment or evaluation. A simple, straightforward statement, but like most things that are very simple, incredibly hard to do. Because most of us actually spend a lot of our time uh, in judgment or evaluation. And so it's hard enough not to multitask and pay full attention to one thing, but to do that without um, engaging in judgment or evaluation is very difficult indeed. So if we can do that, how is mindfulness actually helpful to us? Well, it definitely allows us to savor all the good stuff in life um, because it actually allows us to, as we as is said, be present in this present moment and not uh, be anxious about fears we have that relate to the future and not be sad about regrets we have that relate to the past, but we're just in this moment. And that allows us to kind of see the small miracles in life, like a spider descending two feet in midair and seeing a connection between that and maybe some of the difficulties that all of us human beings face. It also, and this is very important to what I'm going to talk about, it allows us to be non-reactive to circumstances, other people, and ourselves. Um, yeah, so let's just talk for a moment about the nature of our thoughts. Um, studies have been done that show that humans have easily, I'll say easily over 6,000 thoughts a day. In some instances, it's been more like an order of magnitude more, closer to 60,000. But, but a typical number is between six and 7,000 thoughts a day. And 80% or more of those are negative. And, and negative can be de defined in a lot of different ways. But I'm going to be de defined negative in part as something that is not serving your well-being, my well-being, our well-being. Now, there's a biological imperative for this because, of course, when human beings lived out in the savanna or wherever without a lot of protection and there were threats of all different kinds at any different time, it made sense to have negative judgment because that could save your life. If you heard a noise and you thought, oh, maybe that's a bear or a tiger, um, that that would save your life if you took action assuming that and of course if it wasn't so be it but you're still alive now today we don't face that kind of threat we face a lot of threats but we we don't probably face the same level and frequency of threat that our our ancestors did you know tens and hundreds of thousands of years ago tens of thousands of years ago anyway. So um, I want to give you a little practice at looking at your thoughts. So um, we'll do a little experiment together. And I want to invite you to do one minute of, of just conscious breathing, sitting in your chair. I assume most of you are sitting in chairs looking at your screens. And the goal here is just to pay attention to your breath. Maybe you will inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth or whatever um, way you would like to breathe. And, and I will say, if this kind of exercise is likely to make you anxious, then I encourage you not to do it, but just take a moment to yourself. But if you do want to do it, I encourage you to just follow your breath, pay attention to your breath, and um, you may notice that your mind starts to wander. If it does, we'd say you're a normal person. And if it does, maybe you'll notice that your mind is wandering and just come back to paying attention to your breath. So I'll give you a minute to do that.
So I'll invite you back to the room um, and just invite you to reflect on what your experience was. Uh, maybe you had a judgment about this experiment, that it was useless or silly. Um, maybe you saw yourself um, having your mind wander and move from thought to thought to thought, something we could call monkey mind, jumping all over the place. Or maybe you started to think about something and went down a rabbit hole and just got deeper and deeper into that. But that's kind of how our mind tends to work. And um, mindfulness is the active practice of just noticing when our mind starts to do things like that and bringing ourselves back to ourself. So I wanna talk about mindfulness in the context of emotions because um, that's really, um, in some respects, where we can get very stuck. And emotions are a wonderful thing. Um, they give us a lot of information about ourselves in a given moment. It, you, we may under, experience fear and, and then get curious and say, what are we afraid of? Or anger or sadness. Um, so we can't live without emotions. I don't think we'd ever want to, but, um, but we want to somehow be able to be in a relationship with our emotions where they don't take over and rule us. So what are emotions? An emotion is a set of bodily responses. So we don't frequently think about that. We think about emotions in our taking place maybe in our head or someplace, but it's actually a set of bodily responses to a situation or thought that results in changes to our autonomic nervous system, which is the system that controls things like breathing, heart rate, digestion, and other non-consciously directed symptoms of the body, systems of the body. And there's typically an associated thought with an emotion that may come before, during, or after the experience of the emotion. And here's something interesting. They last typically not more than 90 seconds and frequently less long than that. And I know when you hear that, you may think that's ridiculous because I was angry yesterday and it I wasn't angry for just 90 seconds. So I want to give you an example of road rage, okay? Yeah, so maybe we're driving along and... Um, somebody does something in another car that really gets us going and we're very angry about it. And how is it possible if emotions are only 30 to 90 seconds long, that 60 miles later, I'm still really angry. And so um, the answer is the emotion itself took only 30 to 90 seconds. But after that, we start making we start making meaning of what just happened and it will have thoughts and the thoughts um, can generate new emotions or the same emotion over and over again, or the same emotion much more in much more of an extreme fashion. So mindfulness is about turning reactivity into responsiveness. And the difference between reactivity and responsiveness is this, reactivity is a hardwired response that makes it seem like there's no choice in a situation. Like someone cuts us off in a car and we get really angry, maybe rageful, and it feels like there's no choice. Um, responsiveness, on the other hand, is the ability to stop, observe dispassionately, or I'll say without judgment, and choose a course of action. And none of us are gonna get rid of our reactivity. So let's forget about that as a, as, as a possibility. At least almost all of us won't be able to do that. But the real question is how long is the interval between when we feel a, a bit of reactivity and when we can switch into a mindset where we're being responsive rather than just being reactive. And if we stick in a place of reactivity, the emotion is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and it's gonna take over. And that, as I say, is probably a negative situation in the sense that it's not for our well-being. Whereas if we can be responsive to, to a situation and notice, wow, that really made me angry. Or that was, I'm afraid because of that. Or something happened and I suffered a loss and I'm really sad. Then anger doesn't have to become rage. 
And fear doesn't have to become paranoia or anxiety. And sadness doesn't have to become depression. If we can just notice and allow it. So sometimes we can get into really destructive cycles of reactivity. And we're talking a bit about stress here. And I want to, I just want to um, um, make it clear how mindfulness can help with that. So as I said, stress and, um, and anxiety, which go hand in hand, are um, really, anxiety is really about a fear that's projected into the future. I'm afraid of something that might happen. And I start to worry about it and I get anxious. And that can build, if it builds and builds on itself, it can actually lead to a panic attack. So what we wanna do is interrupt that cycle of reactivity so that a fear can just be a fear that we're aware of and not become something in the future that we're very afraid might happen that causes anxiety or worse yet becomes a world unto itself, a panic attack. So I want to talk a little bit about it, uh, more about anxiety uh, because it's a real source of stress. And anxiety is something that, um, that, that people who have cardiac issues feel a lot of. And this is my experience in the hospital. So I just want to describe a few things. For example, Dr. Stern talked about all, all of these risk factors. So what if you're doing a great job? with all seven of those risk factors and you end up having a heart attack. And you think, what am I supposed to do now? I did everything right. And yet this still happened. Or let's say um, you, you have a heart attack and you end up in the hospital and, um, and you're told you're gonna have to change this, 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 and this. And you start thinking about that and what that's gonna mean to you and your quality of life. And you get very sad and anxious about that because it means a fundamental change in, in how you're gonna to have to live your life. So um, these things are all, and there are, are a myriad of other things. I'll tell you one thing I frequently hear from patients in the hospital who have come through something is they really wanna go home, but they have a little anxiety about going home because they know as long as they're in the hospital, they're being monitored. And if there's ever a problem, someone will be right there immediately to, to help them. And there's a sense that people say where, um, when they're identified as having some kind of cardiac issue, every every sensation, every tightness in the chest or an un, un, um, explained pain, everything can become a story. And the stories will cause anxiety. And this is why we really have to quiet the mind. So if something is going on, of course, you're going to get, get it treated, looked at and treated. But I do want to close this little section of anxiety by saying, by citing this quotation, one of my favorites by a 16th century French philosopher named Michel de Montaigne, who said, I have suffered a great many misfortunes in my life, most of which never happened. So um, we want to be careful to stay as present as we can and be curious. Notice if we're ha feeling fear about something and say, oh, that's interesting. I'm feeling afraid about this, but not let it cycle off into anxiety. And one way you can do that is by just taking a few deep breaths and noticing what's going on in your body and becoming curious. So I'll say a bit about depression, which is, goes frequently hand in hand with anxiety. Depression is something that frequently involves this sense of being very alone. And I talked about a theology of connection. And um, when, we're, when we're experiencing depression, there's a sense of profound loneliness that things are really not going well for me. And I, I I, somehow there's no help available. And so what I want to say is um, the beauty of, of um, connection, and this is really what we aspire to more than anything as chaplains, is the, the connection that occurs in the present moment that can be very healing. So again, when we go into a room, no matter what's going on, 
there's a connection between two people. And that in itself can be very comforting and sometimes very healing. So it's important for you to recognize that you're not alone. Somebody is there for you. Some force is there for you. And the best you can do to tune into that, the more comfort you'll feel. So um, I have to wrap up soon. So I'll say, what can you do? This is what people find useful depending on your resonance. They can pray. They can spend time with family and friends. We can do something we love to do, like singing or exercise or reading that connects us to ourselves. We can take a walk in nature because sometimes a connection to nature is what kind of locates people in a spiritual context. And we can practice mindfulness. And um, if there's one thing uh, I want, I want you to take away, like the, the seven risk factors, it's this. Um, you can be an observer of yourself. And the way I think about this is you can be the star of a movie that you're also watching. And it sounds like uh, maybe an impossible thing to do, but it's not. And it's, it's a small but fundamental shift that makes all the difference. I'd say it's cultivating the observer. So you can be in something, doing something, and observing yourself at the same time. So if something comes up and that makes you very scared and you think about what the implications may be and you start getting anxious, you can notice your anxiety and you can get curious about it. And you can take a few deep breaths and um, hopefully interrupt that cycle and quiet your mind. So um, I'm going to do a very quick body scan with you because we're basically out of time. But um, I want to, if you're interested, invite you to um, get comfortable in your chair. And if you're, if you're so inclined, allow your eyes to close or cultivate a soft gaze. And take a few deep breaths. And rather than scanning our entire body today, we're just going to focus on our heart and our chest as we take some slow, quiet inhalations and exhalations. And we bring our attention to our heart. And we just notice what's going on without judgment, without evaluation, with curiosity, what's going on there. Maybe we thank our heart. We think, we think that our mind is us and we think that our emotions are us and we think that our body is us. But really, we can have a relationship with all of those things, acknowledging that while they are us in a way, they also are something independent of us. And we are something much more than that, that can observe all of these things from a place of quiet and curiosity. And we can thank our heart for doing all of that work all the time in the background and we don't notice, we take it for granted. And instead we can just notice it today, give it a little bit of attention and say, we're grateful to you for all that you do. And with that, I wanna thank you and I will return, return the, uh, the baton to Heidi. Rabbi Han, thank you so much for um, that practice today. Um, and I just wanted to start with um, a personal question, actually, um, that I know a lot of people talk about. And they hear, like you say, the buzzword mindfulness. Um, but as you say, it really is a practice. 
Um, can you um, just talk a moment about how often should somebody practice mindfulness in order for it to really be effective for them? Okay, so mindfulness practices come in all shapes and sizes. And I would say the first, there may be many people on the call who have um, meditation practices that they've been doing for years and years, and other people who are just kind of hearing the words sort of for the first time. So what I would say is you want anything you try to be successful, no matter where you are in the experience. So set yourself some goals that are realistic goals. If you're just starting out, recognize that there's value in a mindful practice that could last 10 seconds. And it's available all the time. A lot of people think of mindfulness practice as meditation, but that's not necessarily the case. You can engage in mindfulness practice while you wash the dishes. It's just bringing your full attention to what's going on and experiencing it, noticing without judgment and being curious. So for example, washing the dishes could be I can't believe these dishes were all left for me and I'm scrubbing them and I'm feeling resentment the entire time. And that's not uncommon. But again, ask yourself, is that really serving you? Or you could start washing the dishes and notice, wow, this water is warm. I mean, it actually feels quite lovely on my skin. And I'm just kind of focused and that becomes a practice unto itself. And when it comes to kind of um, self-awareness and self-exploration, you can, you can do a body scan whenever you want. And there are body scans that last really 30 seconds. And there are body scans that last an hour and a half. The key with all of these things is just to bring your full attention to whatever you choose in this moment. Do it as best you can without judgment or evaluation and be curious about what you find. And anybody can do that anytime. Um, frequently, mindfulness is associated with the breath. And this is what I've said this to my children since they were young, old enough to understand. I said, actually, and I like to think of myself as a good father, but I, said, I say to them, your breath is your best friend. And I say that because it's the first thing you did when you were born. You probably got slapped on the behind and you started crying. And you started breathing. And it's the last thing you'll do before you die. And it will be with you every moment of your life between those two points. So it's a great friend. Think of it as a friend and pay attention to it. It's, it's a wonderful thought. Thank you very much for that. Um, somebody was asking about resources um, that may be available for like honing in mindfulness skills, um, either online or in person. Yes, there are tons and tons of apps online. There's one called Breathe, which is B-R-E-A-T-H. There's one called Breathe, which is B-R-E-E-T-H. There's Headspace. There's so you can you could do a Google search that said uh, 10 best mindfulness apps. And um and and actually um, I'm trying to remember you, you can even uh get uh, a review of the different apps and how much they cost. But those those are very popular ones, things like Headspace. And I'll say this too, if you're interested in any particular type of practice, you can search for that. The University of San Diego, for example, has a public website that has many, many body scans on it from, you know, as I said, really short ones to very long ones. So they're very available, very available. Bay State actually is developing its own um, anxiety app with different types of, um, of uh, practices. That's great. Thank you. And I know that some you, there are a service fee, but some are free, which is fantastic as well. Correct. And some, that, some have a free version, as with all apps. Just will have to sit through some advertisements and try to stay calm and not angry when you do that. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stern, I just wanted to um, uh, bring to your attention. Are you still with us? Yeah. Yeah, there you are. Um, someone was asking early on um, about natural ways um, to control or reduce blood pressure um, from your talk. 
Um, I think the, the, the lowest hanging fruit for that is uh, staying active and exercise. Um, keeping in mind, um, not just aerobic exercise, but resistance training is, are, are both really good ways to, to lower blood pressure. Um, and then low sodium diet. Absolutely. Which are very common things that we recommend certainly, um, for our cardiac patients. Um, uh, another one that had come up regarding smoking, they were asking about ways to reduce the risk or damage from 30 plus years of exposure to secondhand smoke. So they weren't a smoker, but they were around somebody, um, you know, possibly a family member or some close person, um, 30 years of, of secondhand smoke. What can they do at this point? Um, that's tricky. I mean, um, unfortunately, the exposure is what it is, and that person had uh, has some risk associated with that. Um, I think the best thing that I would recommend going forward is to avoid further exposure. That's that's a that's a tough question. Right, right, but certainly re reducing what you can control at this point, like you're saying, yeah, fantastic. exactly. Um, Maybe. Yeah, I just I saw in the chat there was a question. What do you do when trying mindfulness makes you stress? I was just going to ask wanna, that. Yes, uh -huh, yeah. I was just going to address that quickly. Um, again, we don't want to conflate mindfulness with meditation. What we think of as meditation, because meditation, meditative practices can definitely stress people out. If you're someone who is very active by nature, I'd say that's not maybe the way to go. But as I said, there are a lot of ways you can practice mindfulness that aren't about sitting still. You can do mindfulness practices when you're out taking a walk. The next time you're taking a walk, which is actually one way to reduce cardiac risk factor, instead of just allowing your brain to cycle off into um, uh, you know, thoughts and regrets and things, to-do lists and all of that, which means you could just be at home in, in that case, Try to notice what's going on around you. Open your senses. Listen, maybe there are birds singing. Maybe you come across something that smells quite wonderful or bad. And just notice it. And so you can be, and I told you, you can do mindful practice while you're washing the dishes, which is something most of us do every day. So there are a lot of ways to do that um, without sitting on a pillow. Good, thank you. And and then this is, you know, right up your alley. Certainly, I know you, you talk a lot about or talk with people right after they've had some sort of cardiac event or dealing with some sort of cardiac event. And uh, this person is just asking very specifically about suggestions on moving forward and past the anxiety after a major illness. Yeah. Um, so I said people frequently have ambivalence about leaving the hospital because they're going home and they're feeling, and then they're subject to not being monitored and not having necessarily people around that they're accustomed to having around because nurses were coming into their room and so on and so forth, and maybe even a chaplain now and then. So again, I would say it's from the standpoint of not feeling alone because it can be a very lonely process. Do what you make sense for you to find connections. And, and again, it could be with God, it could be with community, faith community, civic community, uh, other kinds of communities, reach out to friends, family, ask for help. And, and by being mindful, you can also start connecting to yourself. And those all help a lot. And, um, you know, and then you know, I don't want to minimize the role of medications. It's not my department. But, you know, if, if anxiety really is out of control, you know, maybe you talk with your doctor about um, doing something to just break the cycle of anxiety, and that will give you a bit more space to do some of these practices. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Stern, back to you, I just wanted to bring back a, um, a, a mention of uh, alcohol consumption, which I know is definitely a risk factor. There's many other risk factors that I know you didn't talk about, but I just wanted to give you a minute with alcohol consumption and as a risk factor for heart disease. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. In fact, um, there are some new guidelines that just came out that, that um, essentially no amount of alcohol is, is um, helpful for, for the body and in particular the cardiovascular system to think of it 
is to have one or two drinks a day. Um, and there's probably some harm uh, with that. Um, sorry to be a, a party pooper. Um, specifically with alcohol in the heart, um, the couple of things that I see most commonly are um, really heavy alcohol drinkers who come in um, with heart failure. It can be direct, directly toxic to the heart muscle and cause something called a cardiomyopathy, um, which is reduced squeeze function of the heart. Um, and so a patient you know, may have been a drinker for a long time and then gradually develop that cardiomyopathy and then comes in in acute heart failure. Um, and then the second most common thing that I see a lot of is, is atrial fibrillation concerns, um, even in light drinkers. Um, it's important to remember that um, AFib can result from alcohol intake. It's a trigger, um, particularly rapid episodes of AFib. So um, really great question. And um, I think it's something else that uh, is, is worth emphasizing. And uh, I know, again, we don't talk about um, illicit, you know, drugs, cocaine and, and heroin and, and steroid use, things like that. They also fit right into that bucket, too. We don't want to ignore them because they are certainly critical to, to be paying attention to. Yeah, I mean, cocaine um, is thrombotic, um, you know, makes us more prone to blood clots and heart attacks, but also can cause cardiomyopathies as well. Thank you. Um, and one last one I just wanted to address with um, Rabbi Han. Um, are you aware of any statistics that uh, demonstrate people who practice mindfulness have a lower rate of cardiac incidence? Yeah, there, there are quite a few studies on that, actually. Um, so um, there, there are studies that show that people who reduce stress in one of the techniques is practicing mindfulness are... Um, less likely to be rehospitalized within 30 days. Um, there are uh, studies that show that mindfulness has, mindfulness practices have, and this is something I would have Dr. Stern speak to in terms of the actual um, degree of efficacy or importance of this, but um, it, uh, it, it allows, it, it re, re, doesn't have their risk of um, lowering variability of heart rate. So my understanding, and I'd let Dr. Stern speak to this, but we, we want to have variable heart rate. Um, and mindfulness helps to allow for greater variability of heart rate, which is, I know, a good thing. I think I see Dr. Stern um, nodding about that. Am I? <laughs> Do you want to jump in for a second? <laughs> You have to unmute Dr. Stern. Um, yeah, so just to make sure I'm understanding the question, you're you're, you're wondering what the if there's true benefit to having variable heart rates versus a fixed heart rate. Yes. Um, I would say in terms of exercise, you know, I think it's good that we augment our heart rate with exertion um, and having the ability to do so. You know, some something that I see of in a lot of patients is that inability to get up in heart rate when they're doing something as simple as going up the stairs and they have fatigue. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I think you're probably talking more about general variability and yes, I'm talking about general variability. And, yeah. And allowing for a greater range of heart rate, I think. We'll say a heart rate that is appropriate to the circumstance. Heart rate that's appropriate to the circumstance. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. So I, I, there, there are studies out that do show that mindfulness-based practices um, affect risk factors positively that are associated with cardiac disease. There are there are studies. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I know that we um, have gone over our time by about 15 minutes, but that typically is, is you know, what happens when we have a couple of speakers. We want to thank you both for uh, sharing your information with us today. It was always, you know, extremely helpful um, in, in many ways, just to remind us of our risk factors, but also um, that stress and anxiety, depression, you know, there are ways that we can help to manage it when we feel sometimes very hopeless and helpless in those cycles of um, of stress and, and challenge there. So thank you both. I we all appreciate it.
Thank just you. wanted to uh, remind everybody that we do uh, every Sunday have additional uh, lectures that are going to be coming up. Uh, next week, we do have um, a lecture that's going to be about today's open heart surgery. Uh, we'll, again, we'll have two presenters, Dr. Engelman um, and Shell Krasafi will be uh, joining us for that talk. The following week is going to be specific to women and heart disease um, and the challenges that we um, see with uh, the different risk factors and the different symptoms that women may deal with when dealing with heart disease. Um, and then finally, we turn our following uh, week, February 27th, to a vascular discussion about leg cramping. Um, it is something that's very common in people that are over 50. Um, and is this something that um, we should be concerned about uh, with regard to peripheral arterial disease or peripheral vascular disease? How do we determine the difference? Um, so it's going to be uh, three more great weeks that we are uh, looking forward to. Again, you can uh, register for these events on the baystatehealth.org website where it says view virtual events. It's a little green icon uh, on the webpage. Uh, and we will look forward to seeing uh, people or look forward to uh, having people join us, I should say, in the coming weeks. Thank you all so very much.